There it is. I think you're good. Yeah, but I don't want it. I don't want it on, right? Okay. Oh, sure. Go ahead. I have always wanted to learn how to do that, but um, so far, no show. Thank you, James. Um, good morning. I am really pleased to see everybody here and uh, to see that you're sticking around to talk about advising. We are excited about what we're doing in advising, and uh, I know you've all been kind of waiting for more information, and uh, our, our students are, are going to be really thrilled with what we, they find once we get this all ramped up. Um, first, though, I wanted to just thank the faculty here for getting their grades in on time. I will never cease to be amazed. This school is really good at that. And what that did for us this fall, um, we had a very short timeline for getting grades in and then communicating with students about their academic and financial aid status. So our folks in student records and financial aid were able to get that information out to students before Christmas so that they had as much time as we could possibly give them to uh, address any issues that they might have. So more of our students are ready, and I thank you. Um, yes, it's worthy of applause for sure. Another quick announcement is that uh, Stacy Mestas tells me that we have conferred 237 degrees on our students for fall. Now. We may um, go up to about 245 because there's still a few that are kind of waiting for some transcripts and things from other schools, but that's compared to 218 last fall, so we're up significantly, and thank you and congratulations to the students that were able to finish this fall. And two other things that are, are just quick announcements. One is Please look at the academic calendar for next year. It's got some very significant changes in it. That was publicized a couple of times, but you know, you don't look at something until you actually need it. And I just want you to be aware of what that looks like. We're trying to make it be more logical and coherent for students to enter, be prepared, take their classes. So there are several start uh, sessions as Joe was talking about, we don't want people registering late for classes, and so this new schedule format helps us do just that. So if a student's not ready, right when classes, the first session of classes starts in August, we will be saying, that's not a problem. We have some other classes starting in two weeks and two weeks after that, so that we will be in student services working to orient those students, make sure they've got books, and do all we can to help them be ready to go right when they hit your class. We don't want people starting late. The first day of class is as important as any other day in your class, so we don't want anybody missing it. So that's an exciting piece. Um, another quick thing is please watch. Uh, we're doing the policy revision, and we have a nice vintage 1987 uh, policy on the student fee allocation process. And so we're having our student life folks update that, and so you'll be hearing from uh, Jill Kozlowski and her team as they do their best to do an update and get it out for consultative feedback. So please watch for that. And now I would like to uh, bring Catherine Fluelling up here to talk about our rollout of the adv advising program. We're very excited to be able to start this spring with a couple of specific groups of students. We're going to have all the new entry students for spring semester, which includes anyone who's had a gap. They, they were not here this fall. Um, new students to college and transfer students from other places. That's one group. Those are the new people for spring. And then the other group that we wanted to bring in right now, because we have fewer entry students in the spring than we do in the fall, is our student athletes. So we're going to transition student athletes right now because that group has uh, quite a few different things they have to pay attention to and it's a little complex. So we wanted to have that time to work with the, the uh, coaches and the students to get them started out on the right foot 
in a spring semester, which is not quite the same deal as a fall semester for our athletes. So those are the two groups, and I give you Catherine Flewelling to talk about advising. And after she's done, I, I, I thank you for the clap. Um, after she's done, I also wanted Julie Wilson, our Director of Scholarships and Financial Aid, to talk about work study. That's a, a topic that's important to a lot of us in terms of employing our student workers. And she and Dennis McAllister in HR have worked really hard to figure out where we are with that and how to fix where we are. So take it away, Catherine. Thank you. Hi. Oh, please don't do that. <laughs> Wouldn't want to disappoint you all. So um, I've been here just over two months now, and I thought I was meeting a lot of people and really getting to know the college. And looking around this room, I realized I was really, really wrong. Um, I have not met most of you, so I really look forward to being able to do that and to work with you. Um, on your tables, and we might have come up short on some tables, is the advising syllabus. I see the choice of blue was unfortunate, as it, it's also the color of the schedule, but if you have extras and want to send them back and forth uh, for everybody to look at that, that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'm going to get to that a little bit later. Um, I have some comments, and then I'm sure you're going to have some questions that we want to answer. So, um, I'm really excited to be a part of this holistic advising initiative here, as it really shows a commitment to our students and to their success in a way that I think we haven't been able to do before with advising. Um, the student development research tells us again and again that the more significant connections and relationships students have with people who work at the college, the more successful they are. And that is really what this model is built on. We want to increase those relationships and connections with our students. Um, the model is providing, um, the idea of holistic advising provides the students with another lasting relationship um, that will follow them throughout their college career that will help them um, be responsible and will help us be responsible to them as well. Um, the idea of one advisor being attached to a student throughout their college career creates for them a resource that will stay with them and somebody they can go to again and again to either help them with things or to definitely be able to direct them to the right place to go. Um, we know that many, um, probably far too many of our students pass through the college without connecting to anybody in a significant way, and that is what we really want to combat. This model of having one advisor attached to a student throughout their career um, definitely assists in doing that. Uh, we need to become and want to become more intentional with the way we interact with our students, especially with the students who tend to pass through and not connect to anybody. Um, as Joe's comments were, were saying earlier, we need to create for them systems that do that, and that is what um, the holistic advising model will do. Um, it will help them to, s to connect their lives to what they are learning in the classroom and to connect the various pieces of all the experiences they're going through together. Um, being able to do this will help students uh, see and understand how the behaviors they exhibit contribute to their success, um, how their environments and the pieces of their lives do that as well. Um, Kathleen McClenney from the Center for Community College Student Engagement um, says, and this is one of my favorite quotes, and I have it written on a huge post-it note in my office if you come and it's the only thing on the wall in there right now, it looks awful. Um, student engagement is unlikely to happen by chance. It has to happen by design. And that is really what we're after. Um, as Joe was talking about creating programs that are structured, that are assessed, that are continuously improved upon, um, that is what we're trying to do here. It's also about tracking our students and the success they have at the college, collecting data, which really, um, in the advising area um, has been lacking. And we need to uh, definitely become data-driven or data-informed in that area as well. Um, one outcome we have hoped to have with the holistic advising model will allow um, the opportunity for us to work more collaboratively together. 
um, across department lines to share information to benefit students. And two things that we are able to put in place this spring that we're really excited about to add to that will be creating advising li liaisons with the academic areas. Um, one advisor is going to be assigned to programs, to various programs, attend those program meetings, really learn about those programs, be able to bring that information back to the rest of the advisors so we all have consistent information for our students and creating liaisons with athletics. Um, advisors have been assigned to the various clubs or teams and they um, will be meeting with them, will be advising those students and so they will be their continuous contact with that as well. Um, it's one way to get our athletes more engaged in the, the entire campus community, which is something we're really looking forward to. I've noticed since I've been here that when I talk for a while, I become really out of breath, and I sound like I'm going to faint, and I've been blaming it on the altitude, but I'm realizing that's probably not the excuse anymore, so if I sound that way, forgive me, I'm not, <laughs> not going to collapse. Um, <laughs> we have posted uh, three pieces on Eagle's Eye to help explain how the advising model is going to roll out. One is the advising charter, um, which really explains how the whole initiative started and um, where it's going to be going for the next few years. The advising syllabus, which was handed out on the tables, which the advisors have worked diligently on creating. Um, I think they've done a really nice job. And then the advising liaison piece is explained further there as well. Okay. These are all my notes. So. I'm sure you have lots and lots of questions. Oh no, Judy has a question, yes. <laughs> the, the advising syllabus is on Eagle's Eye if you were not able to get one today. I know how the, the rumor mill goes and there have been lots of concerns about um, making this change and this is one that we really um, will need everybody to work together on to benefit our students and it's really going to to lend to that effort greatly. Um, we are going to roll this out in pieces taking as Judy said the the new incoming students this semester. One thing we don't want to do is disrupt any relationships that have been established um, between students and anybody else. We just want to add to those and enrich those. Um, as we go, we'll keep adding more and more new students as they come in, and then students who are in programs that, like general studies, that may not be connected to anybody. Um, we are so looking forward to all of these pieces being able to come together and our connections being much closer and being able to work collaboratively um, to benefit our students. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. How does this model, how will it relate to um, online students or students who aren't able to come to campus? And we definitely will allow for that because the way times are now, there are so many of those students who need flexible hours, who need to be accommodated in various ways. Uh, phone advising, ad advisors making visits other places, online advising will be incorporated into the plan as well. And, and we have uh, some models out there around the nation in using D2L or your, uh, the learning management system for advising. And so we'll bring that in to right now. We're, we're not ready to do that, but uh, even one of our advisors has gone to a conference on just that topic of the, the remote advising. Also, another piece that we are hoping to implement in the next year will be a type of early alert or retention software that will allow us to track students who are at risk or who are exhib exhibiting at-risk behaviors um, from both the faculty and, and the advisor end and then be able to come together on those situations. Yes.
Oh, absolutely. Um, faculty are the lucky ones who get the day-to-day -day contact with students. You get them in the classroom and you get to see them all the time. Um, we want to bring all of those great opportunities you have to other parts of the college as well and be able to connect a student that intimately to other parts of the college. Um, so whereas an advisor will be assigned to a student to help them with all the processes things that faculty should never have to learn, <laughs> just all the nitty gritty stuff of you know registering, dropping, financial aid, and all this other stuff. An advisor will be there to link all those elements and the faculty can be the expert in the area, which is what the students really want you to be. That's where the, ad, the advising liaisons will be there. The person who is assigned to that program from the advising office will be there to learn all those things and make sure that all of that information is being brought back to the other advisors. That, that, that intake advising too, that you're, you're sort of talking about that brand new student coming into the college and that intake advising, which, um, the new orientation model will give them all the information that they need for uh, getting registered, the, the, the things that we have looked at and said, this is stuff that you absolutely have to have. You have to know about D2L. You have to know about this, that, the other thing. And then they will be advised by advisors from the advising center for that intake advising. So intake advising will not be a, a huge difference from what we've been doing all along because Faculty are not there all summer, which is when most of the students come in anyway. So we'll, we'll still have our advisors ready uh, to follow the curriculum that you have designed. And uh, as well as that is um, communicated in our catalog and from discussions with people, that's what they follow still. So they're looking at their entry scores, their transcripts from other schools, they're looking at the curriculum that we have and where you can start. So that, that, that initial advising will kind of remain somewhat the same. But we will have some very big differences, which is that there will be specific paperwork or, or tracking of that appointment and what the decisions were and what that student was supposed to, to uh, sign up for. If they have questions about, so what are the different things I can do? How does this English um, AA from LCCC connect to something that I want to do after here, that will be something that then we want to refer them to you as the English faculty to talk about those things. Those are not the pieces that there's no way the advisors will have that expertise for every single program. So, so that's kind of that, that dance. I don't think that's big difference from what's been going on. The difference comes with then our follow through with that student because the advisors are going to be keeping track of that initial advising, then they get assigned an advisor. I'm not sure exactly at what moment they're assigned a specific advisor from the advising center. But then those students will be tracked by that, their specific advisor. They'll look and say, okay, this is what the initial advising meeting, they agreed to, to, that this student would take. Did they take those classes? How did they do in those classes? And they'll be walk talking to those students throughout the semester. When we get this early alert system, say, um, and Tanya and I were just talking about that, say uh, you have a student and that student is also in Tanya's class and that student is also in um, anybody else's class. And in two of those classes, the student's not doing very well. And so D2L says, hey, that student hasn't logged in, hasn't attended class for however many days that we decide. And an alert goes through the, the system and it alerts you as the teacher, well, you already knew, but it also alerts the student, says, hey, we're on to you, you're not doing very well, how can we help? And then it also alerts the advisor. So that's now three notifications that have gone out for that one class. If the student's not doing well in a second class, the advisor knows that too. And so now you've got that support system that's very different from what we have right now. You've all been working kind of in isolation with each student and the student sees each one class as a separate piece of their life instead of part of the whole. 
So this support system will give um, that, that kind of coherency to what we're trying to do together with those students. Does that, did that answer your question? Or she did that answer your question? Absolutely, of course, um, and the model will be hopefully even more attentive to those things for students. Um, they will have consistency with advisors and um, back and forth relationships with the faculty as well. Um, the your first part of your question are probably some systems things we don't have quite worked out yet, um, as we're not even to that stage yet. Um, so I have made a note here and will definitely be conscious of that, thank you. Yes, John. Well, I don't think advising day is going anywhere. Still That's still on the calendar, okay. yep. Um, so you are probably about a year and a half ahead of where we are. Um, things are going to stay the way they have been for you and your students now. Um, and as we roll this out in pieces, and if you look at the charter, you know, this goes out through to 2015. So um, it will be very incremental and very intentional with all of those pieces. It's not going to be haphazard. Absolutely. So when you put that in there early, when they not only are you going to see an advisor, you're going to see your mentor again. Absolutely. Well, and the difference Great. too, John, right now with these new students that will be coming in, is now there's someone asking, did you do what I asked you to do, which was to go talk to Rob? Did you go talk to Rob? No. Why don't you go talk to Rob now? Let's call Rob and make you an appointment right now. Nobody's doing that right now. And so even with those, those new spring students and our athletes, those, that group will have someone asking that question because they'll be keeping track that, hey, I asked Susie Q to go talk to John, and so I better check and see that she did that. So immediately you'll have some level of um, follow-up to that relationship, whereas in the fall we had none of that. So. Um, that mentoring relationship we don't have mapped out yet, so as we get our feet on the ground with the advising program, we'll be talking to you folks and asking what, what should that mentoring relationship be and what training do people need to take that on. So that's, that's yet to be built, but thank you for, for bringing that up. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. Right. Yeah, great comments. Um, at the school I just came from, I designed the early alert system there, and we presented it in a way to students that you're not being sent to the principal, you're not in trouble. We do notice a concern in behaviors you're exhibiting, whether they're not being prepared for class, not doing well on tests, um, attitudinal problems, all sorts of things, that we want to see how we can assist you with that. <coughs> Um, students were very responsive to it. Um, they, they thanked us for having somebody watching out for them. So those are primary concerns when rolling out a program like that for students, absolutely. And when we get to the point where we are ready to do that, we will be seeking lots and lots of input and it will be a great collaborative effort of ours. And I might just add, I keep jumping in here, but I'm so excited about this. <laughs> um, but the other piece that in those early alert systems, it's all about relationship. And so before a student ever has an early alert issue, they know that advisor. And so it's somebody they know they're comfortable with already. And so that's an easier conversation. And the advisor has little power over that student in terms of their grades. So it's a conversation they can have. You know, this is how you might approach your teacher to improve your attitude or whatever the, the issue might be. But that's, that's a, you know, the, the advisors are going to be what I call kind of a guide by the side to help them navigate all of those systems themselves um, and, and do better. So I think those are important. Our number one action on that system was, have you spoken with your professor? Let's make an, uh, an appointment with your professor right now. We found that, you may not know this, most students are really terrified <laughs> of their instructors. <laughs> They are afraid to go talk to them. I went through my entire college career without speaking, I think, to a single one of my undergraduate professors. So I definitely come from a place where I understand that. Um, and that was a concern of the faculty at the time, and that is definitely the number one thing. Does your instructor know what's going on? Have you spoken with them? Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. There, it's gonna be full circle. <laughs> Not just going to send this random note and it disappears. No, there will be the whole thing. Yes. Absolutely, that's got to be a part of that program, yes. Um, a referral system, when a student is um, referred on the early alert system, that it doesn't just go to a single person, that it goes to a network, and all the people that can possibly be involved with helping that student are involved. It's awful, isn't it? I know. Yes, yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> um, when a student wants to change their major, the current process, who is able to do that now? And with this new process, who's going to have that authority? And how are the others going to be informed? Okay. Stacy, do you want to answer, answer that question? <laughs> Currently, if a student wants to change their program of study or their major, they can do that by um, clicking on a link in Eagle's Eye, and then the submission is submitted to the records office, and we make that change. The students can also submit a change request at the counter, and we make that change. Going forward, as the advising model is further implemented, we will probably look at changing that, and that the advising office will then have some oversight and assistance with pro students changing their programs of study. But that has not yet fully been decided. That's correct. D did you have a concern that? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 it just seems like some of the students, um, they it just seems like some of the students, when you look, they don't have their correct major. 
like some of them will be business and actually they're in the, some of the allied health programs. Yes. And so just keeping them on track and so that they don't fall through the cracks. <laughs> Judy's giving me that look because already in analyzing our data, we have realized that there are, are there are lots of things like that that need to be tidied up in our system, and that is one goal definitely is to tighten our data in that area. We look and see there are students with you know three active programs out there. Yeah, how does this happen? Right. Anything else? Yes. Um, with this new plan, any student that comes into your office this semester, are they getting like a full academic plan for the full for the time they're here? What classes they need to you be mean enrolled? Currently, in as of right now, yeah. Um, right now, because we are only doing, we are still doing the walk-in model, and we don't have the case management system going. Um, I would say they're getting probably a semesterly um, okay. look right now. Uh -huh. Advisors definitely go over the program with students, um, but as we look to roll this out probably in the next two weeks here, um, that will definitely be changing. And the cold thousand class is linked to that too, did you say? Yeah, Cole's 1000 class, um, the, the kind of freshman seminar course, is going to be a key element in making sure that students all have an academic plan. So. Some of Absolutely. them need quite a bit of career exploration before they can make a plan, so it's not always possible to do that in the first appointment, for instance. And then I have a question. When do you propose the software will be um, implemented? Uh, hopefully by next summer. Okay. <laughs> the other interesting thing about making sure when you're advising that the students get their degrees changed and current is that I get a lot of questions about why did I get this list of students for scholarships when they aren't even in our degree program. We have no way, Vito has no way of pulling them if they don't have their right academic uh, degree posted. So you may get somebody for Starla's area that's really equine. And we apologize for that, but we have no way of telling when Vito runs that list for the foundation scholarships that say, you have to have a 2.5 and a math major. We have no way of knowing that unless they um, have the right major in the program. And I expect to see lots of changes there as we re-examine that whole scholarship program. Anything else? Am I off the hook? Oh, no. I think it would be a fabulous step, in my opinion, as Joe said. <laughs> yes. And, and along with that, uh, that's something that we'll be asking Jose and the deans for help in implementing that type of a thing. It's really, we don't have the authority to, to make you do those kinds of things. But another little piece that I wanted to mention, and this might segue us into financial aid, is that um, you know, we ask you to take attendance and see notice and, and uh, be, re be responsive to who's in your class and who's not, who's on your roster, who's not in the classroom. Because if students never show up and we ask you to um, redline those students and tell us who have you never ever seen, and, and sure, we would love that if they don't show up that first day, you call them and say, hey, we missed you today, and we do all we can, of course, one-on-one -on -one to get them into that class. But if they truly are not there, we want you to report that. We have, um, that is a, a sort of an uneven practice around here, and we'd really, really, for students' sake, need that to be more consistent, because one of the things that happens that uh, Julie Wilson has been showing me is that we'll have maybe a student with five classes and three of those instructors redline them and say, I've never seen them. Two of them don't notice that, and so they, they leave them in the class all semester. 
that student may have been dispersed some aid, and yes, it's a shame that that student would pick up that aid and not attend classes, that's, that's on them. But we could have prevented that aid from dispersing if they never were showing up for all five classes, if we knew that. Then we would take them completely out, they would never get that money, because those are students that never pay the money back either. And so then that drives our default rate up, and we owe, they owe. It's just a bad situation for everyone. So there are lots of those kinds of things. When Joe was saying so many things need to change at once, it, it is all rolled together, and it links together. Going back to your question, too, we know at the community college we have so <coughs> many various levels of students. And you know, I've frequent and understandable feedback to students is one of the best things for them. I have met with students who've spoken with instructors and say, well, he told me I had a 79, but I don't know what that means. You know, so making those terms understandable for students and frequent to know where they stand because they will be afraid to approach and ask. Yes. One more question. Yeah, and I think that's a conversation that we should probably have um, with uh, Jose and with uh, some of the other academic areas because that's a, an area that, um, again, I, I, would, I don't think that's something that student services would, would say, this is when it's, it's a, a done deal. We'll, we'll need that help from you. Thank you. Please send me your concerns, your comments. I um, definitely want to hear all of your input. So thank you very much for listening today. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> and I'd like to ask uh, Julie Wilson to come up and talk. Uh, she might, I don't know if our friend Dennis is here or if he is leaving you alone to talk. He does. So. Um, here you are, Julie Wilson, to talk about some of our financial aid uh, work-study issues. All right. Good morning. I know right now I am in the doghouse with a whole bunch of you, and I'm so sorry. Is this better? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know I'm in the doghouse with a bunch of you right now. You had a work-study student who decided not to come anymore, and then they left, and you asked me, can I get another one, and I said no. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I have some of you who thought for sure you were told something last year before I got here that you were going to have all this unlimited student employment, and I said no. Again, I'm very sorry. I am. I am so sorry because I hate getting those emails. I hate getting those phone calls. And I have a response, but I have a responsibility. And my responsibility is to make sure that the program is being run in compliance. Okay, do I have to swallow it to get you to hear? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so what we're going to do is for 1415, is try to streamline the work study process so that everybody here understands what we have to do. And how we got to this place is we didn't have any, any there were no controls, no mechanisms, no, um, I don't even know when people are working in work study. That's how bad it is. I thought we had 26 students. I ran a different list. I had 55. I have people submitting timesheets with the work study code who never talk to me. I have, <laughs> my favorite is they gave them work study and they never filed a FAFSA. You have to file a FAFSA to get work study. So we are going to take all the guesswork out for me, for Dennis, for you, and for the student. And so what you will get next week is a form called a position request form. If you want a work study in your department, in your office, in your area, 
you will have to submit that form. Right now, if the funding levels remain steady from last year to this, then the budget will allow for 35 positions. 35, I, got, I just told you 55 people are working in the program right now, so you tell me what's going on. <laughs> but 35 positions is what that will support. And when we get to those 35, we're done. So you'll submit your position request, what you think the rate of pay should be. Um, you'll recommend a ra rate of pay. HR will determine what it actually is. Um, how many hours you expect a person to work in your area and so on. We'll approve the position or deny it if we have reached 35 positions. We'll get the position up on ISIM so students can apply for that position. Once you get approved for your position, come April, you will have to send someone, whoever is going to be assigned um, as the super.
um, requirements. Here's one. I did, I'm from Michigan. I'm very glad not to be in Michigan this week because it's two degrees. <laughs> two degrees. My son got here Tuesday, I think it was, and um, I think it was negative 10. And he comes in and he, he gets off the shuttle and he says, Whew, it feels like summertime. <laughs> It's 38 degrees, and it feels like summertime, so that's what's going on in Detroit right now. Um, <laughs> but anyway, in, in, in Wyoming, apparently, when a person stops working, you got to get them a check within five days. So how many times do we find out way past five days that somebody stopped working? Okay. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> So we need to know when a person stops working, even in work study, so that we can be in compliance with the Wyoming reg that says you got to pay this person within five days. So this is going to help us all be in compliance with all the various little um, pieces of regulation. You know how it is. You get government money, it's regulated. Um, and it, so it's really going to establish some very tight controls around the program that will help us all. Um, so why are the changes necessary in case you didn't figure out? I'm frustrated, so that's the very first reason why those changes are <laughs> necessary. And um, anyway, <laughs> I won't say the rest. I'm, I'm just saying that when I'm frustrated, things change. <laughs> Everybody who has had to work with me directly knows that. I've gotten quite the reputation. I won't apologize for that. I will tell you that when I get frustrated, I take care of it. And so this is how we're taking care of it. We're tightening it down. Um, it is a Title IV federal financial aid program, so it has to be tightened down. And um, due to a lack of controls, as I just told you, I thought we had 26 students in the program we have 55. I thought we were spending 108,000. We had 175. I can't eat $75,000. And I'm not gonna eat $75,000. And unless you want me to send you a bill for $75,000, we are all gonna follow the new rules. All right, any questions? <laughs> I dare you. <laughs> I dare you to ask one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. No. I, I, you know, I, I am all as hopeful as I can be, and I really do want us all to, um, to be supportive. I want to support the departments. I want to support the institution and the college, but my number one responsibility, despite what anybody here thinks, is to the Department of Ed. So the rule with financial aid people is we work at the institution, but we work for the Department of Ed. So I gotta stay in compliance, and that's the number one thing. So yeah, I had a good time telling you the what what, but the truth is, <laughs> most of the time, I say about 97% of the time, it's not my way or the highway, it's the Fed's way. And so I want to be in compliance, I want the school to stay in compliance, I don't want to sit with the auditors, and I don't want to charge you $75,000. Okay, other questions? Right here. Um. I, uh, I can, but let's make sure there's no work study questions first, and then I will answer that. Okay, so work study question over here. No problem. So her question is, she has very specific requirements for her job, 
and if she gets awarded one of the work study positions but can't find a student to fill the position, what should she do? Or what will be the process at that point? So what I'm gonna tell you, and you're not gonna like it, if you know right now that history has shown that you cannot find a work study person to fill that position, don't ask for it in work study. Just go on and make that a part-time employment position, put that in your budget right now. That's, that's my advice. At some schools, what they, that what they do is they look at that type of, of uh, need that the college has, and it is often that you can't find work-study eligible students to do things like tech support, tutoring, and maybe in the IR office, I'm not sure exactly and what your requirements are, but those, those are areas that the, the need is so specific, and because work study, you have to be number one financial aid eligible to access that money. It's a subset of our total student population, so we aren't always able to say what that pool of employment might be, or that employment pool might be. So uh, what Julie is saying is exactly right. We might need to have that discussion at a higher level when we're talking about those positions of um, which ones on campus. Do we really have such specific uh, kind of technical needs or educational needs that it's, it's going to be rare that we have a work-study eligible student fill that? Okay. Any other questions about work-study? Hi, Roxy. Here's the way work study works in terms of the financial aid and the student specific piece of it. Student files their FAFSA. There's a question on the FAFSA that says, are you interested in work study? They check yes, we award the work study. Because they can't even apply for a work study position if they don't have a work study award. Once they get a work study position, this is how it's supposed to work. It's not working that way right now, but this is how it's supposed to work and it will next year. Once they get, the, uh, they get the award, they get the position, we match them up, the student is good to go. We will have 35 positions for approximately 2,000 students that are eligible for work study in the first place. So just because a student is awarded work study, and we tell the student that, does not mean, number one, that they can't find a position, so we're just going to give them the $4,000. That's my favorite one. <laughs> the second one is, just because they're awarded work study, they're guaranteed a job. That one's a little trickier to explain to the student, but we do. So the 35 positions, th that is that many positions available for students who have a work study award. So you can see how very competitive that will be on the student side. Any other questions about work study? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, her question is if the position request goes out next week, students for work study can't begin employment until when? Work study is a financial aid program and we operate in academic years. So the position request is for 14, 15 August to May. That student would not be able to start working in that program in that position until August. And they will have to stop in May. Because Work study is a financial aid program run in academic years. That's why Dennis sent me instead of him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. All right. Is that all the questions about work study? One more. Hi, Sabrina.
Okay, her question is, if the student gets awarded the work study, they can't get a work study position, so we award 2,000 students work study, and we only have 35 that can get it because we only have 35 positions, what happens to that other 18, 1900 and change, right? Those students can come in and ask us for additional funding through student loans, through whatever is available to them. There's no guarantee that that $4,000 or $3,000 would be made up to the student and other aid programs. It's all about what they would be eligible for. Okay. Reluctantly, any questions about anything else financial aid related? <laughs> this is Julie's happy face during the time <laughs> during the time of the year when she is madly trying to process students who had to appeal their financial aid or that we have to make adjustments to so that um, all systems are go for the spring semester, so I know she's uh, <laughs> raring to get back to her office, and <laughs> we might be happy to let her go. So <laughs> Very good. I'm not always this cranky. Okay. I will answer the question about the red lines. So I'm going to answer the second part of the question first, and then I'm going to let Stacy answer the first question. So the reason for the red lines is this. I can't pay a student who never attended. If they come to your class one time, I can pay them. Doesn't make sense, but I can. And we did. That's why I'm cranky. Um, <laughs> Because I get the F grade report and they stop coming September the 3rd. I got a whole lot of work to do. Um, so, so the reason for the red line is because you cannot pay a student that never attended. And if you don't tell me that a student never attended, and I'm not going to say anything because I don't know who the instructors are, you should be happy about that. <laughs> but. I got a list of 1,579 F grades. I'm on F grade number 254, and I have sent Judy at least four students where I got an F grade, and the student has a never attended flag. Now, I'm not happy about that, because that means I paid a student that I shouldn't have, and now I got to pull back the whole kit and caboodle in their financial aid, which if you had told me that the student never attended at the beginning of the semester, I wouldn't be on student number 254 out of 1579. That's my life right now. That's why I'm cranky. Um, <laughs> that's not why, but. Um, <laughs> I'm always cranky, always. Um, I'm a financial aid director, that's what we are. Um, so the reason for the redlining is not because I want to inconvenience you, because I want to tell you as instructors how to do your jobs, but because it's a compliance issue and it is an auditable compliance issue. And so that's why we have it. Now Stacy knows the date, the last date, all we want you to do is tell us, did this student ever attend? And the date is, is it the census date? Yes. <laughs> She's nicer than I am. <laughs> so I had actually planned on sending you all an email later today with these important dates, just because I know that there are always questions every semester about red lines and do I have to, don't I, by when, and what if they come the first day and don't come the second, and there's all these different scenarios. So until we have a clear institutional definition on exactly what is required, it is still left a little bit up to the inf to faculty discretion. So the first day of classes is the 13th. We will distribute rosters to all of your offices the morning or afternoon of the 13th. 
I need all of your rosters back in the records office for your students who have never attended by Friday the 17th, the latest by Tuesday the 21st after Martin Luther King Day. The reason is because this is a manual process, unfortunately, so we have to take each of these students out of your classes one by one. So I can't push a magic button and make everybody go away. Would be my preference, but I can't. So I need your help in making sure that we get your rosters on time and that they are documented and signed and turned in. I prefer they be turned in to the records office and not emailed because there's a chance that I may miss something and I don't want to do that because that could be you know, bad for our students or something else. So anyway, I would prefer that all the rosters be turned into the records office by the time that I've asked. Um, the question I always get is, well, what if they don't come the first day? Well, if they have never attended the first day, if you have a Monday, Wednesday class and they're not there on Monday and Wednesday, redline them. Be done. If they come back to you on Friday and say, oh, can I get back in? Then that's a conversation you need to have. It's also a great idea to reach out to the students like Catherine and Judy had talked about. If they're not there on Monday and they don't show up again on Wednesday, reach out to your student and say, hey, class has started. We miss you. Where are you? You know, and if they haven't replied, then redline them. It's to their benefit, especially if they're getting aid, because then they aren't in the position of these 1,500 students that Julie is working with in owing back a lot of money and having failing grades. Arshi? It is a great question. Um, I would say you never ever want to do that without the students' participation once they've started attending. And so that um, doing that with, I'm, oh, there's the question, oh, good, I'm sorry about that. Her question was, um, a student is attending the first week, two weeks, and then they kind of go MIA. And so what is the best course of action for the student? Are she saying that, the, um, would it be best to initiate a withdrawal from your class? Would that be best financially for the student? Or what should you do? And, and that's where I'm saying, once a student has begun participating, you don't know probably whether they're a financial aid recipient or not. And that's a key element of this. And so that's why we want the student involved with any withdrawal from your class. Sometimes that's what we would call an earned F, because you, they started. They tried, well, th they'll, they'll have a last date of attendance that you have to fill in with your grades, and that will tell that story. But we would like to be able to do some trying to contact that student, and you are just awesome the way you try to contact your students and make that effort. Um, any of you, I would encourage you to do that. You've got their contact information in Eagle's Eye, and you can go in and try to contact that student because it is a very critical thing. Some of our students end up with a great big bill, and they didn't really understand the system. Remember, uh, not all our students have a lot of support in their lives for knowing how school works. And they think, I quit going. Of course people know I quit going, so why are they charging me money? Or why am I still in your class? They don't know those systems, and, and it takes a lot of teaching to help them know that. The advising center will help with that as well, and they will try to contact that student if you're really struggling. So let's, let's just join forces and try to do what we can. If that student needs to be withdrawn from the class, we want that student to be informed and be part of that process, and we will help with that. Anything else to add to that, Julie? I wanted to also add that right now we have two systems that are working um, with the students. And it is the dropping and how it affects their transcript and dropping how it affects them financially. And so they have seven days to drop from their classes from day one to day seven to get a 100% refund of their tuition. Okay, and this is also separate 
in addition to the financial aid. They have day 8 through 14 to get 50% of their refund of their tuition. So after day 14, they will not get any of their tuition reimbursed to them. And then after day 14, then Julie then needs to go in and do her R2-T4 recalculation to back out all of their after day seven. So there's a couple of different systems that we need to be aware of, but right now our students are being stuck with, if they're not being dropped or redlined from their classes, they still have a $1,300, $1,400 bill that they have to be paid. And a lot of these students are um, being sent to collections, and we hate doing that. And so if we can avoid having to do that and getting these students redlined from their classes, that will help tremendously. So right now we've got some different systems working. We're trying to get that cleaned up so that our W's and our drop dates and all of that are all aligned so that it's more understandable for our students. Yeah, we have more questions and, and we would love to talk some more. I don't want to use up the time of the people after us and I know that uh, we have uh, Rebecca and Les on deck. And so uh, what we would encourage you to do is please ask those questions. If you still have them, email them to Julie or uh, Stacy or Sabrina and we will get answers to you. And if they're of general interest, we'll try to maybe uh, post those I don't know, email others, the whole faculty or something to make sure that you understand. So thank you very, very much and uh, we'll work with you this semester. <laughs>